Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I hope I have made something clear throughout all of the videos on my channel that I think that there are many effective and useful ways into reading the past. One of them happens to be to chart the way in which civilizations have innovated, made technological advancements and inventions. And there are many that we can follow. The space race for one. But today we're looking at something a little bit different. Because the path to innovation is not a one-way street. There are lots of side roads and occasionally dead ends. One thing that is quite clear to me is that if you look at the history of humans walking on the face of this earth is it seems that we have always tried to find new and inventive ways to hurt, maim and kill each other. The history of weapons and their development is a cornerstone of our understanding of the past and arguably the present therefore. But today I want to look at a particular technological dead end in weapons formation. This item doesn't really make any sense. It's phenomenal. It's arguably one of my favourite historical items, even though it has such a negative connotation. Because as wonderful as it is, it must have been pretty terrible at what it was designed to do. Today, we're talking about the Apache Revolver. While there aren't a huge number of Apache Revolvers that do survive, there are some, and here is one of them. This peculiar object was said to have been designed by Louis Dohn in the 1860s in Belgium. It was only manufactured up until the end of the 1800s, which may go some way to explain why so few of them survive. However, it's also possible that few of them survive because it simply isn't very well manufactured. And if it was put to all of the uses that it was supposed to have been able to be used for, I'm not sure how structurally secure it would be. However, it wasn't until after they were believed to have stopped making these weapons that they actually got put to their most famous, or rather infamous, use. In the early 1900s, they fell into the hands of a brutal Parisian street gang known as the Apaches. They were famous for their particularly violent mugging technique, pictured here. Now, I assume that this is a reconstruction, Knowing what I do about photography in the early 1900s, I highly doubt that two muggers would stand still enough with their victim to have a photograph exposed for the length that it would need to be to have this level of clarity. Also, despite what you may have heard about the bystander effect, I'm fairly sure that if somebody saw someone else being this brutally mugged, they would intervene rather than snapping a picture. As you can see, the victim in this picture is being garroted by one assailant while another rifles through their pockets. However, there is a claim that this weapon, or one based heavily upon its design, was put to a somewhat less nefarious use in the hands of the French resistance and also possibly British commando forces during World War II. It is important and telling, however, to mention that Whitehall has never confirmed that British commandos ever used this weapon or one like it. So what made up the Apache revolver? And is it really as rubbish at its job as I claim it is? Is this murderous multi-tool the Swiss army knife or leather man of defensive or offensive weapons? Or was its bark much worse than its bite? I think from looking at the images, it's fairly obvious why the Apache revolver is known as a combination or multi-tool weapon. What we can see here is that three otherwise separate weapons have been mashed up to form one weapon alone. We have a knife, a set of brass knuckles and the body of a revolver without the barrel. The revolver component shown in this example comes from a so-called pepper box revolver. On display is a six shot chamber which would have held 7mm or 0.27 calibre cartridges. As I mentioned, there is no barrel, which would make the aim on this weapon fairly poor, only useful at quite short distances. But the lack of a barrel on the revolver of this combination weapon is not the only aspect that people take issue with when attempting to detail and define the efficacy or functionality of the Apache revolver as a whole. 
An article by Alex Lockie, published for Business Insider Online on August 12, 2016, is entitled The Eight Worst Guns Ever Made. And in at number one is our very special friend, the topic of study for this video, of which Lockie says the following. Perhaps no other gun on this list overpromises and underperforms like the Apache pistol. This pistol appears to combine the effective ingredients of a knife, brass knuckles and a small calibre revolver into a neat fold-out package. In practice, none of the three components of the weapon deliver. The brass knuckle component works well enough, but the knife is thin and flimsy on its hinge. The revolver, with virtually no barrel to speak of, is terribly underpowered and inaccurate. Additionally, because of the unguarded trigger, the user is likely to accidentally fire the weapon often. More recently, on the 18th of May 2019, Mimeto Adan, writing for the skyaboveus.com, has the following article, entitled Why the Apache Revolver is a Terrible Weapon. One of the things that Adan's review of this weapon does is it takes it apart, down to its individual elements, and thinks about how useful each of these elements would be when part of the whole. Adan starts with the revolver, saying, This weapon can kill you, period but it will only kill you in extreme close range. It uses the pepper box design, where each cylinder is its own barrel. In the case of the Apache revolver, the cylinder was shortened up to a point where it never had a barrel. When a gun loses a barrel, it loses accuracy and power when fired at a distance. Because of this, the gun could only be used at close range, a problem made worse by its lack of sight. And do note that this type of pistol had no trigger guard or safety catch. Hence, when it was folded and stored inside a pocket, it was common practice to leave a chamber empty under the hammer. In this way, accidental discharge was avoided. Another disadvantage was its reloading time. Firearms of that period have problems with quick reloading, and when reloading the Apache revolver, one must remove the cylinder to refill it. Next, Adan moves on to explore the blade and the knuckles, saying, Not much can be said about the folding dagger. Rudimentary is the best way to describe the blade. I own folding knives, and in terms of self-defence, folding knives should have the proper blade length, lock durability and speed of deployment. And yes, you need a nice sharp blade to stab someone to death. However, Adan qualifies this, saying, One doesn't need an overly sharp blade to kill someone. In fact, soft metal prison shanks are good murder weapons. I'm saying this because the dagger part of the Apache pistol needs not to have hair shaving sharpness. The problem here is the length. The dagger is simply too short to do enough damage. The blade is only 1.15 inches. Aside from having a puny blade, this knife requires two hands to deploy, though it could be open with one hand. The lock is basic and there is a lot of play and wobble in the blade. This means that there is a potential of breakage with repeated stabbings. We cannot say for certain that the brass knuckle part works, though it seems obvious that it is capable of breaking someone's face. There are no written accounts of how it was used. Will it cause accidental discharge of the weapon? Will it damage the gun when used? I have never had the opportunity to interact with or handle or even see an Apache revolver in the flesh, so to speak, but I do find them fascinating. And as such, I've spent quite a bit of time looking into them. I'm particularly interested by the reviews of them made by people today, like the ones that I just talked about. People who have had the chance to see them and possibly interact with them. And what's telling is that there is an almost unanimous verdict. This thing doesn't work. Or rather, it doesn't work as well as it could. The three individual components that make up this weapon work better individually than as part of a whole. So why are they put together? Why, for a period of around 40 years in the late 1800s, was this being manufactured? How does it end up becoming the defining symbol of that violent Parisian street gang? Why is it used by the French resistance and possibly by British commando forces when attempting to win the tide of war in World War II? Well, I can't answer that. But maybe it is because of the way it looks. The fact that it's pocket size might be useful, but ultimately, I think that this thing instills fear. If you were to find yourself confronted by this weapon, you would at least pause. If you didn't know how effective it was, then this 
combination weapon, I think, would instill fear in you, at the very least. And maybe that's the point. Maybe it can be a case where its bark is worse than its bite, because the intention is to have the bark, bite or no. Is it about threat rather than efficacy? Is it about stunning somebody into silence and compliance? I think also, in the case of the resistance and the commandos, this pocket-sized capacity is what is most useful about it. It doesn't have to have enormous amounts of power. These are people who are interested in close quarters fighting, as perhaps the gang might have been. It might not be effective in a modern context, but if we think about the uses that it may have been put to, and certainly was put to, I think it's incredibly effective in those contexts. Here we have a weapon that can be secreted about the person and can perform multiple functions. It's something that can be used in silence, at close range. Just the sort of thing that a nefarious mugger or a freedom fighter might be looking for. But what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below. Perhaps you know of another weird and wonderful weapon from history that you would like me to talk about on this channel, and that's the place to put it. Alternatively, you can come and find me over on my social media. As always, I will leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box down below. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel, and while you're there, why not hit the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.